Hi everyone and welcome um, to our webinar this evening on um, our St Lawrence Church Brentford Waterside talk. Um, I hope you can all see me. This is the first time I've actually used GoToWebinar, so do please excuse me if there are any mistakes. However, this webinar is being recorded, so if um, if there's anything you missed or there's anything you'd like to see later, we will be sending out copies. Now, if you'd like to ask questions, on the left-hand side of your screen, there is a little grey strip that says questions. If you expand that questions panel, you can write your questions in there. I will see them and pass them over to the teams for our panel session. Um, added to this today, um, we do have two speakers. We have Michael Henderson and Alex Blanks, who will be speaking about generally about um, uh, excavation of this type, and then also Alex speaking specifically about this site. And then we're also joined by Helen and David um, for our panel discussion and our questions and answers. Um, a little warning just to just to say that because of the subjects we are talking about today, this this means that during the presentation we will be showing photographs of uh, human remains. With this, um, if, if you prefer not to see it, I mean you can turn off your screen but just listen if you prefer, um, but this is all done in a very respectful way, it's a very um, dignified way and also a way that hopefully um, gets across a point and a scientific point without um, anybody feeling upset or concerned with the images they see. I'm hoping it will be fine. And what I'm going to do now is change presenter and pass it over to Michael, who can um, who can introduce himself. Um, and if I could ask all the other panelists to turn off their mics and their cameras. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Clarenderson, and I am a human osteologist or bone specialist for MOLA. So the focus of my talk this evening is to give a brief background to what we can learn about the past populations through the study of human skeletal remains, and in particular, the excavation and osteological analysis of burials from the post-medieval period. Now, the Analysis of the human remains from St. Lawrence's Church is still an ongoing. Um, so I'm not going to be showing any pictures of human remains from, from that site in my talk, but the, the images will be from several contemporary sites across London. So this will aim to show how the excavations at St. Lawrence Church can be placed in the wider context of post-medieval London and how the information gathered can inform our knowledge and understanding of the population at this time. The examination of the human remains excavated um, um, can help us learn a great deal about life during the, the post-medieval period. So this was a time of great change when London underwent massive growth and development. It was largely a pre-industrial city at the start of the 18th century gradual changes to the local area and environment coupled with massive population growth and rapid urban expansion led to increased pressures on resources. Overcrowded living conditions, poor sanitation and all of these aspects were in to impact on all areas of human life such as life expectancy and contributing to the spread of disease. So some of the key things we we try to identify when we examine a skeleton are the demography, so that's how old someone was when they died, if they were a male or female. Um, we can take measurements of the bones that can give us an indication of their living height, childhood growth rates and, and development. We can look at the bones for clues regarding health, the foods they may have eaten, and also evidence of diseases and injuries. We can sometimes see clues that give us indicators of activity, lifestyle in the living environment, or perhaps medical interventions or treatment sought. And sometimes we take chemical analysis of the bones and teeth, such as ancient DNA or stable isotopes that can add another level to help us understand 
who these people were and how they lived. So in London, analysis of several large assemblages has taken place over the past decade. A recent study on behalf of Historic England examined all archaeological burial ground excavations in London since 1980, where over 100 burials were recovered. This included 51 sites and 35,000 burials. It's important to note that this doesn't include the excavations at St. James's Euston as part of the HS2 project. So this provides a really important resource with which to compare any excavated population. However, the study identified several gaps in our knowledge. There was a bias towards sites in central London. There was a predominance of Christian burials. And there was also a bias towards the 18th and 19th century. Also, information from Western London remains largely underrepresented. There are only a handful of sites that have been subject to archaeological investigation. These include All Saints Church in Chelsea, um, a Jesuit cemetery in Roehampton, St George's Chapel in Brentford, so just down the road from St Lawrence's, and St Paul's Church in Hammersmith. So when we examine different populations, we can start to see differences between regional populations. The analysis of the demographic profile of a burial population can indicate different risks based from different aspects of a population. So historical records suggest that almost half of individuals did not survive into adulthood during the pre-antibiotic era. The London bills of mortality showed that about 25 to 30 percent of those born did not survive their second birthday and 40 percent died before the age of five. So here on the screen we have a graph representing two populations that we have excavated. The red line indicates a population from East London, St Mary and St Michael, and the blue line represents a population from Paddington Street in Marylebone. So the Marylebone population was a wealthier population and we can see that there is a low rate of children, but a higher rate of adults into the older adult age categories, suggesting greater longevity whereas the East London population has a high rate of non-adults aged between one and five years, nearly 40% of the population, which matches the historical records, but there's a drop off in the adult ages into the later age categories. So, so the Marylebone population contradicts evidence from other sites and contradicts the, the historic records, um, but probably the East London population represents this lower status population, um, higher rates of poverty, which were affecting life expectancy at the time. So in this rapidly expanding urban metropolis, Poor hygiene conditions, high population density, provided fertile conditions for infant diseases and mortality. Little was known about the well-being of children who were often brought up in poorly ventilated and unsanitary conditions. But early childhood is a critical stage of development and we see skeletal indicators of stress, such as a failure to reach full growth potential. And this likely reflects this vulnerability, a vulnerability to inadequate weaning, childhood disease, gastroenteric disease and the local environment. And one particular disease that we see very commonly is rickets. So this is a disease of childhood, but it doesn't directly result in death, 
although it can cause an increased susceptibility to infections and other illnesses. It's a disease caused by a lack of vitamin D, and this is necessary for the absorption of calcium and phosphorus, which is important in developing strong and healthy bones. We get some vitamin D from our diet, eating certain foods like oily fish, but the majority of our body's requirements come through exposure to sunlight. And deficiencies occurring in childhood can result in softened and weakened bones, which no longer support the body's weight and become bowed. As you can see in the images here, these are the lower leg bones of an individual and they have quite a severe bow shape there due to this weak weakening. So a high prevalence in the post-medieval period may reflect urbanization, growing population levels, together with increasing industrialization and pollution that may have contributed to a reduction in sunlight exposure for those living in towns and cities like London. For the urban poor crammed into overcrowded tenements with narrow, dark alleyways, this may have had a more dramatic impact. This may also reflect childhood illness and sickly children being kept indoors, exasperating the condition. So another condition we see very, very commonly is dental disease. Now, poor dental health affected people of all classes during this period. A change in the prevalence of dental disease, including cavities, mineralized plaque deposits, gum disease and abscesses has been recorded from the 17th century with a marked increase during the 19th century. These rates likely reflect a high cariogenic diet of refined sugars and carbohydrates that would have been easily affordable. Poor dental health also likely reflects a lack of oral hygiene. Now, if you don't brush your teeth and bacteria accumulates in the mouth and your teeth begin to decay, ultimately they die and will fall out and you may seek dental health, a dental treatment. And the 19th century saw great advances in the use of dentistry. Here we have an image of a cavity that has been filled with gold leaf. And here we have next to it a tooth that has been filed down, possibly because, because it was decaying. We also occasionally see evidence of false teeth, so dental prostheses. So these could have been made from ivory or porcelain. The problem with these is they tended to stain or didn't look realistic. So the, the, the preferred material was to actually use real human teeth. And here you can see some real human teeth. They've been screwed into a rose gold mount held in place by gold pins. But what's particularly interesting about this example is that they're not anatomically correct. They don't match or they don't look like the teeth they're not in the normal positions so there's some extra teeth on this side and that probably reflects the the only teeth available that were used by by the maker it's important to stress that for the majority such treatment would have remained unaffordable um, and so only the wealthier individuals would would have had such access to to such treatment. We also sometimes see activity of behaviour or occupation perhaps. So in the image here we can see the top surface of a vertebrae, a backbone, and you can see a little hole, a depression there. This is called a Schmalz node and it represents the herniation of the intervertebral disc. So the evidence suggests that higher stresses placed on the spine, possibly through activity from a young age, perhaps through manual work, such as carrying heavy loads, can cause an increased rate of, of these markers of, of stress. Now here we see the side x-ray image and photo of a mandible or lower jaw. And this reveals evidence of 
radiolucency, so areas of dense lesions and areas where the bone has thinned. One possible diagnosis of these bone changes is osteonecro osteonecrosis or localised bone death. When localised in the mandible, this has been associated with phosphorus necrosis or fossy jaw. This was a new industrial disease where white phosphorus used in the tips of matches poisoned the factory workers, causing their mandibles to turn gangrenous. Evidence of traumatic injury can reveal the hazardous nature of workplaces and the dangers of urban life. Fracture patterns are often consistent with accidental injuries and falls. Evidence of interpersonal violence also hints at the volatile nature of London streets. For some, those who had suffered particularly bad fractures or injuries, amputation was the only option available for a surgeon. And prior to anaesthetics, sterile, sterile operating conditions and antibiotics, the chances of surviving such a procedure were, were low. However, we see evidence of both successful and non-successful attempts to treat the patient. So here we have a thigh bone, the femur, and we can see new bone has formed at the end, creating a stump. And this tells me that this person survived the amputation, whereas here we have another cross-section image of a, of a thigh bone. You can see the striations caused by the saw, but there is no evidence of new bone growth. And sadly, this individual did not survive the procedure. Advances in medical science promoted the use of dissection to further knowledge and understanding of the human body. A shortage of legally obtained cadavers of executed criminals resulted in a rise in the illegal trade from resurrectionists. Poor graves may have been an easy source for such bodies, and the Anatomy Act of 1832 legitimised the use of bodies acquired from workhouses. So here we can see the spine of an individual that's been sawn, possibly to examine the, the spinal nerves and spinal column and the back of a skull that has different saw cuts, possibly representing um, surgeons practicing new techniques. Here we have a skull that's been completely sawn and bisected. And this probably results, it will probably indicate an autopsy rather than dissection. So we know that autopsies were performed from the 18th century and were becoming standard requests from coroners by the 19th century. Um, evidence from contemporary assemblages suggests that autopsies were being carried out on people from all social classes. And this lightly reflects the need to explain the high levels of mortality seen in the population. Despite the osteological evidence for disease, we see no evidence of the infectious epidemics that were rife at this time, such as smallpox, influenza, cholera, typhus, to name a few. Um, and the acute nature of these illnesses makes it unlikely that skeletal lesions would have developed. So we have a, a paradox in that skeletons that present no lesions likely represent individuals who succumb quickly to an infectious disease, while those that we see riddled with, with infectious lesions, we've got some examples of different, different infectious bone growths here, these likely reflect those individuals with a, a stronger immune system who are able to fight the infection long enough for it to, to reach the skeleton. Increased pollution levels resulting from coal fires created smog that blackened buildings and poisoned the air. Inadequate ventilation in houses would have contributed to unhealthy living conditions. An increasingly polluted atmosphere may have contributed to a heightened susceptibility to respiratory disorders. 
Evidence of chronic respiratory tract infections can be seen in the remains in the form of inflammatory bone changes to the lung facing surfaces of the ribs and the walls of the maxillary sinuses in the, in the nose. So you might be able to just make out some white colored bone here. So these are lesions on the inside lung facing surfaces of the bone reflecting an inflama inflammatory response to, to an infection. Some of the chronic infections we see, such as TB and venereal syphilis, were significant diseases at this time. TB, or consumption, accounted for over 25% of deaths by the 19th century. And this is related to rapid urbanization and industrialization that favored the spread of disease. TB affected all classes of people, although the disease is exacerbated by poor nutrition and high density urban, urban living conditions and therefore has a strong association with poverty. Crowded and poorly ventilated living spaces would have worsened transmission. Here we have the spine of an adult and an individual vertebrae has become weakened as the, the TB affects the spine and the lesions ultimately weaken the whole spinal column and it has collapsed on itself because it can no longer support the body weight. So this individual would have had a hunched back appearance. And this, in cases of TB, is known as POTS disease and is, is diagnostic of, of this condition. Now, if you survived childhood and avoided accidents or infectious diseases, survival into older age was possible. The London Bills of Mortality suggest that approximately 6 to 11 percent of, of people survived past the age of 70. And this is supported from evidence from coffin plates and burial registers. There was no retirement for those who couldn't work. And there was a reliance on parish aid, the local community and families. We see evidence of certain pathological conditions associated with advancing age. This might include the loss of teeth during life, osteoarthritis, or conditions such as Paget's disease, which you can see affecting this thigh bone here. Now, this results in severe thickening of the bone. While we don't know the causes of this in modern cases, and prevalence rates increase with age, particularly in those over the age of 60 years. We also see evidence of cancers. This is the sacrum at the bottom of the spine of an individual, and there are these scalloped, scooped out lesions that may represent a form of cancer, possibly prostate cancer. We see evidence of both benign tumours. This is a tumour that's formed a shell of bone over a big toe and also malignant tumours. So these punched out lesions in a mandible. These lesions were present throughout the entire skeleton and possibly represent a metastatic carcinoma. Now, not every bone change we see is related to a disease per se. Sometimes we see evidence of habit or lifestyle or even fashion. So the long term use of restrictive footwear can manifest in changes to foot morphology. And one condition in particular, hallux valgus, involves the lateral deformity of the great toe towards and eventually over the second toe. And this can be caused by wearing shoes with symmetrical soles, as were common in the 18th, 19th century, that squash, squash the toes together. If you constantly wear a tight corset or bodice, over time this can change the shape of the ribs. And these ribs here are very tapered and flattened. They have a pinched look. And we, we think that this reflects the, the wearing of, of, a, of a corset. For fashion, sometimes corsets were worn for health reasons, such as back braces for spinal injuries. And another thing we see commonly is evidence of smoking. 
So tobacco first appears in the 16th century and smoking is evident in the form of pipe notches. You would have smoked your tobacco in a clay pipe such as this and if you clench this between your teeth over time it wears a rounded notch. The tobacco products may also stain the inside tongue facing surfaces of the teeth, staining them a, a black dark brown colour. And studies have demonstrated a link to social economic status and cultural identity, in those with evidence of smoking. So why is this evidence important? Why is it important that we, we look at, at human remains from archaeological context? Well, excavations such as those at St. Lawrence's Church can contribute significantly to our knowledge of health and living conditions in London between the medieval and early modern period. Large populations are especially important to help us interpret this evidence. Through the excavation and analysis of human remains from this period, we can examine and better understand this changing and diverse population and learn how the growing city affected the living and working lives of the rich and poor and how the impact of poverty, deprivation and disease can be seen in the bones of those buried. So we can understand differences between burial practices in the city and beyond. We can look at childhood health and nutrition. We can understand changes in demography. We can attempt to identify different religious and ethnic groups and also perhaps trace individual lives. We can look at the evolution of disease and understand the pathology of some of the major diseases from this time. And we can understand how increasing urbanisation and industrialisation affected the lives of those living and working in the immediate surrounding area. London has a unique position with a wealth of historical data such as the bills of mortality, medical officer records and hospital workhouse records, coroner records and, and parish registers. And the osteological and archaeological work can investigate the reliability of, of these sources and historical accounts. And also the, the techniques and methods we use in the identification of human remains are, are the same as those used in modern forensic applications. And by testing some of these methods, such as if we have an individual of known age, we can see how accurate these modern uses in forensic cases can be. So thank you very much. That's the end of, of my talk. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Lovely, great. So this was a good general introduction as to what archaeologists see and where, what they're, they're viewing when they, they look at human remains and all the different evidence and all the different pieces of story we can gather from what is left when we do our excavations. Now I'm going to turn it over to Alex. And Alex was actually, it's actually on the Brentford Waterside site, so he can give you a more of a, an in-depth presentation of specifically that site. Now, when I turn it over to Alex, Alex actually, it's, it's Mike who's controlling the, um, the presentation. So when I turn it over to Alex, it's actually um, Mike who's controlling the panel. So I'm just going to put it over now because Mike needs to um, present. I'm Mike, I'm making you presenter once again and I'm going to leave and Alex leaves his camera on and I'm, and I'm going to turn my camera off. Thank you Alex. Okay, um, thanks Caroline. Um, so good evening, um, my name is Alex Blanks and I work as a senior archaeologist at MOLA. Um, the focus of my talk uh, will be to give a brief background to the archaeological excavations currently taking place um, at the area surrounding St. Lawrence's Church, Brentford. So the site is situated in the Greater London Borough of Hounslow, just to the south of Brentford High Street, um, within a loop in the River Brent. Next slide, please. 
So the site itself is referred to as block A and is the last in several blocks from this development that MOLA has excavated. Next slide, please. So why we're here, as a requirement of uh, planning legislation, prior to any construction work, be it large scale infrastructure or residential and commercial construction work, as is the case on this side, um, archaeological works must take place. MOLA is a commercial archaeology company which excavates and records archaeology before construction work would remove it. By creating an extensive site record, we preserve information and material culture that would otherwise be lost. Next slide, please. So what we already know about the site. Um, the underlying geology of the area is London clay, over which um, are alluvial deposits of silts and gravels. Um, prior to MOLA's recent work on the site, no previous archaeological investigations have taken place at Block A. However, a 1998 archaeological excavation adjacent to the site on Brentford High Street revealed some <coughs> excuse me, limited evidence of Roman occupation and uh, medieval wall foundations. Um, prior to our work at Block A, also uh, extensive documentary research has been carried out, including looking at burial ground records and historic mapping. Next slide. So this uh, postcard from 1910 shows St. Lawrence's Church um, facing the northwest. Um, and you can see the church tower and the vicarage building to the right. The origins of St. Lawrence's Church lie in the 12th century and the church house and burial ground lie within the historic core of the medieval village of Brantford. The oldest upstanding part of the present building is a 15th century tower of Kentish ragstone uh, on the left uh, hand side of the postcard with the flag um, on the top. Um, with the remainder of the structure dating to the 18th uh, century with 19th century additions in brick. The main focus of our work uh, is in the associated burial ground, which lies to the south and east of the church. This was in use from the medieval, medieval period up to the mid 20th century. Next slide. So what we found. Starting uh, with the earliest, um, the, the, the deepest archaeology, um, in the northern area of the site, we found artefacts dating to the Roman period, including potsherds and building material and a small number of coins. Uh, the majority of these have come from the um, disturbed burial soil of uh, the later burial ground. The only archaeological feature we have so far identified um, in the, uh, the main image on the slide is a north-south aligned double ditch containing Roman potsherds and ceramic building materials. Um, the image shows monolith tins which um, are geoarchaeological um, department uh, will uh, examine um, to better understand the formation of the feature. Um, the coin in the top right hand uh, side is dated to the third century AD um, and shows the head of Emperor Constantine. Next slide, please. We've also um, had the remains of some later structures. Um, uh, this is a ordnance survey map from 1894, um, showing the vicarage building, um, the same one as uh, was on the postcard in the top right hand corner circled. And in the bottom left hand corner is a, um, a mortuary chapel, which we've um, uh, excavated the foundations of. Next slide, please. The majority of our work has been the excavation of human remains from the burial ground surrounding the church. And I'll briefly discuss the, um, the process of how we go about um, excavation. 
So due to the vast quantities of overlying uh, layers of material uh, over the burials, it is impossible to excavate entirely by hand. Um, so we use machine uh, excavators to gradually reduce the ground level under constant monitoring from archaeologists. The upper burials are typically between 1.5 and 2 metres between current ground level. At this point, we cover the area with tents and proceed to carefully excavate down to the level of the burials using hand tools. Remains are excavated with due care and attention to decency, and we endeavour to treat individuals in a dig dignified and respectful manner. Spoil is slowly removed from each individual to reveal the skeleton, at which point photographic record is carried out and 3D survey points are taken, as well as a unique context number which is assigned um, with a context record sheet um, which details uh, how the individual is orientated within, within the grave, um, position of the hands, for example, and if there are any uh, grave goods. Um, all artifacts associated with the individual remain with them. Um, Jewellery, for example, will eventually be reburied with, uh, with the same individual. The vast majority of uh, coffins have completely disintegrated due to the ground conditions. Um, however, the metal fittings or coffin furniture um, have often survived. Um, these include uh, grips and decorative motifs and even coffin plates, um, which are very useful um, for dating purposes and even identifying individuals. Um, the skeleton is then lifted from the ground and transported to our office, where it is carefully cleaned of any remaining burial soil, ready for detailed assessment by our osteology team. After full analysis, they are um, transported once again to Brookwood Cemetery, where they are reburied. Um, these reburials will adhere to um, how the original um, individuals were buried um, with respect to the original uh, practices, um, for example, in consecrated ground or within a non-conformist tradition. Next slide, please. The burial ground is split into two distinct areas. So the old burial ground um, in the northern area of the site um, as you can see from the image, um, was in use from the 12th century um, up to 1884. The new burial ground um, in the southern area of the site was in use from 1884 to 1973. Next slide, please. So the new burial ground. Um, this area of the burial ground is split into plots, each containing between one and six individuals buried one on top of the other. Um, the majority we have excavated on site contain um, between two and three individuals. Um, all of the individuals in this area were interned in uh, coffins and a quantity of coffin furniture has been recovered um, with some deeper burials producing intact coffin timber. Um, the image on the uh, left hand side of the screen shows a, um, a grip plate, um, a, hand, a handle, um, with some intact uh, coffin timber uh, attached, uh, which again will be uh, reburied with that individual. On the right hand side of the um, uh, slide, um, we can see a broken gravestone recovered from the upper layers of burial soil, um, which has been um, uh, uh, broken in the past um, and mixed with that uh, burial soil um, after the uh, burial ground went out of use. Um, we've been able to um, reconstruct it. Um, due to the relatively recent um, nature of uh, some of the burials in the, uh, in the new burial ground, 
Uh, we worked in tandem with an exhumation company called TCS, um, who dealt with individuals um, known to be buried after 1920 um, in line with the Human Tissue Act. Um, we excavated with them the, the remains in, in the same manner, um, uh, being monitored at all time, uh, photographed and, and surveyed as well. Next slide, please. So the old burial ground, um, this comprises the area immediately to the east of the church, um, bounded by a north-south aligned brick wall to the west. These burials uh, were less orderly um, than the neatly, neatly laid out plots excavated in the new burial ground to the south. Um, and we also uncovered large areas of disturbance. Um, from later buildings, um, such as the uh, Vicarage building, which actually cut through the um, uh, burials from the, um, the older part of the cemetery. Um, little material culture has been identified with these burials, um, it, things like jewellery and, and grave goods, um, uh, aside from some coffin furniture likely dating to the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, as you can see from the, the slides, uh, there's uh, decorative stud work on some of the uh, surviving coffins um, and decorative coffin plates. Uh, the bottom right hand corner, um, it's a bit difficult to see, but there's actually a row of uh, coffin nails um, which was all that was surviving of the particular coffin after the um, skeleton was uh, lifted, um, uh, showing that uh, this was in fact inside a coffin. Uh, there is a possibility that some of the uh, burials are earlier than this date um, and may have been interred without coffins within shrouds, uh, which was the burial practice during burial practice during the medieval period. Um, the burial, uh, the positions of some of the burials suggest that they were unshrouded due to their, um, the orientation of the, the skeletons, um, uh, which uh, we can study further. Um, in general, this, this area was very densely populated um, uh, with, with several layers of um, uh, burials on top of each other and intercutting. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about um, a couple of examples of um, individual burials um, uh, on the site. So uh, one notable burial was the very first individual that we um, exhumed, um, uh, identified as Gunner Albert Ellen, who died from wounds sustained during the First World War. Um, records state that he was buried on the 13th of September 1917. Under the supervision of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, we exhumed Gunner Ellen um, and he will be uh, reinterred uh, at Brookwood Cemetery with a war grave headstone uh, along with his aunt with whom he was also buried. Next slide please. So this connection um, came from a chance discovery of this uh, glass medicine bottle um, from the disturbed grave soil in the northern area of the site. Um, it wasn't actually found with an um, individual, but in, in the grave soil itself. Um, and it's embossed with the words Wood Chemist Brentford. Um, and after some research, we found uh, a now closed chemist uh, run by several generations of the Wood family at uh, 116 Brentford High Street. Um, and we actually excavated two individuals uh, with the surname Wood uh, on site, Henry and Mary. And records show that Henry Wood uh, ran uh, the chemist from 1851 to 1881, so it seems likely that this may be the same man. Um, on the uh, image on the uh, top right, you can see in red where the uh, the site of the original chemist would be, 
in the bottom of, of that map, you can see where the burial ground was, so it's uh, really close by. Next slide, please. So finally, um, a notable family from the area are the Ronalds family. Um, um, they ran a garden nursery um, on the site, uh, just to the, uh, the west of the church uh, from 1760 to 1880, exporting plants internationally to as far afield as Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the family had close ties with the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew on the south side of the river. The best known of the family's horticulturalists is Hugh Ronalds, who published a book in 1831 entitled Pyrus Malus Brentfordiensis, or a concise description of selected apples that described many of the 300 varieties of apples grown at the Brentford nursery. Um, Hugh's son, John Ronalds, um, landscaped new cemeteries, including supplying uh, thousands of trees for, amongst other cemeteries, Kensal Green Cemetery in West London and London Road Cemetery in Coventry. Um, we're currently excavating brick structures associated with the Ronalds family on site. Uh, with a rather nice inscribed uh, brick of John Ronalds, uh, stamped with his name and September uh, eight, uh, 1811, uh, identified in the evaluation phase. Um, and as I say, we're currently uh, excavating more of the uh, brick structure. Um, uh, and the area has actually yielded uh, quite a large amount of uh, broken plant pots, uh, which is a nice um, connection again. Um, uh, that's the last slide, please. Uh, just one more, I think. Yep, so thank you again for uh, Orion and Ballymore for, uh, for facilitating our work on the site. Um, and uh, that's it from me. Back to the panel. Okay, we're all back. And if the panel can start putting their cameras and their microphones back on, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mike and Alex, for your presentation. Um, and it's all, it's such fascinating stuff. It's really, really interesting. And it's great to see um, what, you, what you can see from these excavations and particularly on this site and, and and be able to name individuals and see individuals. Um, if you're uh, interested in asking a question, on the left-hand side of your panel, there should be a little grey strip that says questions on it with a little arrow. Press that arrow, it extends the bar down, and you can write your question in there, and it comes through to me. Whilst we're waiting for questions to come through, I do have it. There's, there's one quick one. Excuse me, I have to look away at my other screen to see the questions coming in. Um, first question being, uh, is there anyone famous buried there? I don't know if that, I haven't heard, but I mean, I don't know. David, Helen, do you know, is there anyone famous buried at Brentford? I think, I think there is quite a few famous people in the church itself or the old burial ground, but our work so far have concentrated on the new burial ground um, and just part of the old burial ground, which extends into the vicarage. Um, so we haven't actually, there's been no one um, encountered so far that is um, particularly famous. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, I was wondering. <laughs> okay, so next one coming through uh, from David. Thank you. Um, do the number of bodies that you exhumed from the Victorian Cemetery extension match the list that you published? And what happens to the coffin plate and any grave goods? Um, I'll do that one. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty accurate, the um, records which um, we had previously. Um, not 100% accurate. Occasionally we found a, an extra burial in um, some of the graves. Um, and um, so we'll, we'll, during the analysis, we'll um, get into more detail of how accurate they have been. But fairly accurate is our first initial impression. Um, as for the finds and the burial plates, uh, Alex touched on that. They'll all be um, kept 
with the um, bones through the whole process and reburied um, with the individual uh, they belong to um, or they were buried with. Cool, lovely, thank you. And um, as there was another question here. Um, sorry, so there are quite a few questions coming through and some of them are of a similar theme. So I'm picking the ones out that kind of cover quite a few uh, themes from the from one question. So the next one, have you identified the bodies you have exhumed from the Vicarage Garden and when will the exhumation be completed on site? Yeah, I can feel that. Um... So we we have um, uh, exhumed the the burials from the vicarage garden in the old burial ground, um, uh, and we're on 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 plan to finish um, the excavation at the end of next week. Wow, pretty soon. Cool. That's really soon. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, there's a, another one coming here. This is a bit of a longie, so bear with me. Uh, so this is from Alex. Thank you, Alex. Whilst I know archaeologists are caught in the middle, often with development threatening heritage and trying to save or accord with limited resources and time, I would like to ask how ethical it is to dig up countless buried people from the church cemetery at Brentford and move them 15 miles away to Brookwood, sorry, Brookwood a place many of them have never even known or, or lived near. Um, I think if, um, a ch if the church is to become a gym, why on earth can't the remains of the past residents be left at peace where they are in the place that they knew and loved? What is the point of cemeteries if we, can't, if we can just bulldoze them at a whim? <laughs> Um, okay, I might try and jump in and answer that if I can. Um, obviously, there's, qu there's quite a few issues to sort of un unpick there, but um, and I appreciate it's a, you know it's a very delicate, sensitive subject, and we're in, um, you know especially people that have got a, a close connection to the cemetery are going to feel very strongly about um, any disturbance of the human remains. Um, the first thing to let um, Alex and any attending um, parties listening tonight that all of the decision making process has been taken very seriously and has been taken with utmost responsibility. Um, the original um, permission to redevelop the principle of development was secured by planning permission, which was secured a couple of years ago, at which point the church and the churchyard was in a very poor state. Um, there was hardly any upstanding um, monuments and the building itself was in very poor condition and redevelopment of the site is going to see the conservation of the church itself and the opening up of the churchyard to the public. Um, the detail of how that's been done um, has been done um, in coordination with a number of stakeholders. It's not just the developer, it's um, Historic England, the um, various ministries um, of housing and local government, um, Hounslow Borough Council, um, and all of that is is taken into a number of things into account, like um, physical impact to the burials, the blocking of burials, um, an appropriate um, place to commemorate and access the burials, um, and that includes where the burials are going to be reinterred. Um, Brickwood Cemetery is a Grade One listed. Um, registered park and garden, um, which is near Guildford, which I appreciate is 15 miles away from um, Brentford. But the reason it was chosen is because it, it had sufficient space to have um, uh, uh, consecrated and non-consecrated ground. And it also has strong connections to the Commonwealth War Grave Commission. Um, it's also accessible um, by train from London. And I hope when we have, when, when everyone is reinterred and there is a a memorial um, on the site, um, people can see that it's um, a really um, a, a good place for the burials to go to. Um, and in terms of the question, the question raised about um, having potential relatives at St Lawrence that are going to be disturbed, I just really want to reassure Alex that um, at every stage, um, the um, at excavation and reinterment, every single individual has been dealt with with utmost care and respect, and that includes, um, you know, if there are that includes 
uh, infants and um, older people and uh, anyone of any um, status. Um, so just to reassure Alex on that, and if he has any questions on that, he, um, please get in touch. Lovely, thank you very much. Okay, there's some more questions coming through. Uh, one specifically about two burials. Um, this has actually come through from Paul, who sent it through on our, our webinar back in July, and it's really for an update. So I'll read the original question to you from July. Uh, where and how the exhumed burial remains are being currently, currently stored before transfer and reburial at Brookwood? and the state um, as they are found. I fear that given the degree of disturbance and vandalism suffered by the churchyard and the adjoining burial grounds over many years, there may not be much left of poor folk like my great grandmother and great grandfather who were buried there in better times. Now Paul's great grandmother and great grandfather, so that's Mary Ann Field in burial ground, sorry, burial grave number 199 and George Fields in grave number 145. And so, yeah, really ideally an update of where they are presently resting as well, please. Thank you. Um, so I suppose I'll, I'll jump in again if that's um, okay. Um, so, yeah, um, as with the previous inquiry, I'm quite happy it might be more appropriate to get back to Paul with more specific details. But just to let him know that um, that Marianne Field and her associated um, family members that were buried in the same burial shaft have been excavated, as has George from George Field from plot one four five. Um, Mary Ann Field um, is currently um, being uh, looked after at the Mullah offices, where she can be um, osteologically um, analysed and then reburied at Brickwood at the earliest opportunity. Um, George is, um, has been um, excavated and is reinterred at Brickwood. Um, and I'd be happy to pass on any more information to Paul um, about the detail of the two individuals or associated burials that were found with them. Lovely, thank you very much. That's a great update. And um, if I take a, another one that's come in on the on the chat from Jim, uh, will the headstones that remain be taken with the corresponding remains to Brookwoods? Um, so I suppose that, that's uh, I'll jump in on that one as well. Yes. Uh, so all of the yeah the gravestones from the new burial ground, which are going to Brookwood, the um, gravestones will go with them. Um, there, there is quite a lot of gravestones which are unidentifiable. Um, but uh, yeah, anyone's anyone that we can tell definitely dates from the new burial ground will go to Brickwood. Um, we've managed to reinstate one um, gravestone um, that's, um, from the Ransom family um, for their Adam Ransom's great great grandparents who. Um, burial has been reinterred in Birmingham. So the associated um, gravestone has been reinterred there, uh, uh, reinstated there, sorry. Lovely, thank you. Uh, maybe more of a, for the archaeology team now as a quick fire question, when will the analysis be available to read? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, we're, on this particular project, we're doing the analysis itself um, as, um, we're um, before the um, bones are reburied, uh, which will be fairly soon. Um, but the actual publication of the results will probably be not for another year or two at least. Um, so we're getting all the measurements now very quickly, but the actual analysis, analysis and um, study of that and equating that with the historical records and uh, all the uh, finds data um, will be carried out probably over the next couple of years. So probably not for another two years. Cool, thank you. And I think that, Rachel, that answers your question about the, uh, the demography, whether it looks similar to um, inner city sites at all and so on. That will all be part of the post-excavation analysis. So there'll be further information coming for about um, demographics and um, city sites with the analysis itself. And um, I suppose we've got one minute left and one final question. Let's try, um, what did I see here? From Rachel. Okay, maybe this is more of a my question. How complicated is it to set up this type of work? Um, 
very complicated, really. I mean, it's, a, it's a joint effort, really. Um, Orion Heritage have been doing a lot of the behind the scenes um, negotiations, setting up all the um, permissions. Uh, and then Mola's role has been to actually set up the physical excavations on site. Uh, it's been a very, very challenging project for everyone, but um, we're coming to the end of the uh, field work in Block A now and uh, very rewarding. And um, I think it's been a, a great success. Oh, that's a lovely answer to end on. So thank you very much. Like I said, this um, webinar has been recorded. So everybody who signed up for the webinar, I will be sending out to you an email with a link to the recording. Also, I still have a, a whole heap of questions here that we haven't had a chance to answer. I will be writing those down and getting answers for you and sending those out with the email alongside, if you don't mind, an evaluation form. We'd love to know how we do and how we can do better every time. So if you'd be so kind as to fill in the evaluation form, that would be great. Um, so yes, I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody who's attended this evening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got a lot of information out of it. And uh, so this is uh, Orion Heritage uh, Museum of London Archaeology uh, signing out and I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you very much.